Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for February 22nd through 28th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants 18 and 19. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Always excited when the scriptures arrive. Yep. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 15 minutes, 10 seconds. And what would that be daily? That would be 2 minutes, 10 seconds. No problem. Gives us lots of extra time for study. And if you want to study this section by section, you could break it down by the time codes here. Also, Speaking of studying, we've got a new resource to share with you. There's so many people in church history. If you want to get to know these people, let's say a name is mentioned and you're like, who is that person? Go to the Joseph Smith Papers Project at the link that we've got in the description. It's a reference for the people, biographies of tons of people in church history. Good, reliable biographies. And there's lots of references on the biographies if you want to know more about the sources. So check it out. It's a great way to get to know these people. And there's often pictures of them as well. So that makes it a really great resource. Love the guys at the Joseph Smith Papers Project. They do great work. Okay, let's recap what has happened leading up to today's revelation. We are in June 1829. And if you'll remember from last episode, that was an incredibly busy month, or I should say event-filled month. So much stuff happened that is pivotal to the restoration, and these revelations are included. Joseph and Oliver are finishing the translation of the Book of Mormon. We've already had the three witnesses have their incredible experience with the angel and seeing the plates, being ready to testify to the world, and that brings us to the events around Doctrine and Covenants 18. So let's go over the history for Doctrine and Covenants section 18. And by the way, when you're reading your scriptures, be sure in the Doctrine and Covenants to include the section headings. They're really helpful in helping to set the stage for what you're about to read. And in many cases, the section heading is even longer than the section itself. Yeah, but very true. It's Still very helpful. And when we give you times to read your scriptures, you know, the Scripturematic 6000 certainly includes the section heading. Yeah, and something else to consider, we can find meaning in these verses just by flipping open our scriptures and reading them. But to really understand first what they meant to the people that God gave them to in the situation they were given can be even more powerful to help to apply it to our lives. So these other resources, like the Revelations in Context, the chapter headings, manuals, and others, those give you a great resource for that. Do take your time and learn what the context was. So going back to section 18, we're going to take this context from the Institute Manual, the Student Institute Manual. They tell us, quote, The Lord had revealed to the Prophet Joseph Smith, possibly as early as 1828, that his church would be reestablished once again on the earth. In June 1829, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery continued the translation of the Book of Mormon in the home of Peter Whitmer Sr. in Fayette, New York. During this time, Joseph and Oliver also sought to know how to exercise the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood that had been recently conferred upon them by heavenly messengers. While praying in a room of the Whitmer home, the word of the Lord came to them and directed them to exercise the priesthood to ordain elders administer the sacrament, and bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. However, the Lord instructed them to wait to perform these ordinances until a group of believers could be assembled. Meanwhile, as they awaited the Lord's command to organize the church, the prophet and Oliver Cowdery were nearing completion of the translation of the Book of Mormon, which included translating the books of 3rd Nephi and Moroni. Both of these books contain instructions on priesthood ordinances and church procedure, which likely inspired and guided them as they contemplated the time when the Lord would direct them to organize his church anew upon the earth. It was in the context of these events that the prophet received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 18. This revelation was addressed to Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer, 
giving direction about building up the church. It also contains instructions to those who would be called as the Twelve Apostles. End quote. And so that's the setting. So let's look at the verses. This starts out being directed to Oliver Cowdery. But let's move into verse 2. Behold, I have manifested unto you by my Spirit in many instances that the things which you have written are true. Wherefore, you know that they are true. And if you know that they are true, behold, I give unto you a commandment that you rely upon the things which are written. For in them are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, and my rock. Now, that's very powerful instruction to Oliver Cowdery. It's particularly powerful when you think that they have just finished or are finishing the translation of the Book of Mormon. Also from the Institute Manual, we have a little bit of exposition on the phrase, rely upon the things which are written. They say, quote, before the church was organized, Oliver used the Book of Mormon to compile a list of essential ordinances and covenants into a document called Articles of the Church of Christ. This document may have served to guide believers in the intervening months before the church was formally organized on April 6, 1830. And we'll talk more about the Articles of the Church of Christ in our next lesson. So let's go on in verse 6. Behold, the world is ripening in iniquity, and it must needs be that the children of men are stirred up unto repentance. So What's the response to the wickedness that's beginning to prevail in the world? Is it political reform? Social media? Public service announcements? Brainwashing? What is it? The Lord makes it clear that the children of men need to be stirred up unto repentance. Verse 9 gives us the Lord's response. Preach my gospel. This is what the Lord calls Oliver and David Whitmer to do. But why? The Lord continues speaking to Oliver and David. In verse 10, it says, Remember, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. That's why we need to strive to reclaim, to preach the gospel, to lead men to repentance, to preach the gospel for that purpose because of the worth of souls. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, in a general conference talk in October 2011, says, God sees you not only as a mortal being on a small planet who lives for a brief season, he sees you as his child. He sees you as the being you are capable and designed to become. He wants you to know that you matter to him. And that's the name of the talk that that's from, You Matter to Him. There's another quote. You know, President Uchtdorf is particularly good at helping us to understand our worth to God. So, General Conference, April Conference of 2010, he says this, Every person we meet is a VIP, very important person, to our Heavenly Father. Once we understand that, we can begin to understand how we should treat our fellow men. One woman who'd been through years of trial and sorrow, said through her tears, I have come to realize that I am like an old $20 bill, crumpled, torn, dirty, abused, and scarred, but I am still a $20 bill. I am worth something. Even though I may not look like much, and even though I have been battered and used, I am still worth the full $20. How great is our worth? Let's read on and see what the Savior was willing to pay for each one of us. Verse 11, For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh. Wherefore he suffered the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. Notice that in verse 11 and 12, We have a first part of the verse, and then there's a transition at the word that. And it might be even more clear if we said, so that. Here's what Jesus did 
suffered death in the flesh, suffered the pain of all men, so that all men might repent and come unto him. That's why he did it. Why was he risen from the dead? So that he might bring all men unto him. So what does this mean to you? How might this change how you see and treat other people? Knowing that what he did in 11 and 12 applies to everybody. How can we show Christ our gratitude for the price that he's paid? Well, there's an indication of it here in the next couple of verses in 13. And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth. So what can we do to show our gratitude for this gift? Use it and always remember him. In verse 14, wherefore you are called to cry repentance unto this people. That's why. How much joy do we bring to the Savior when we ourselves and when we help others to repent? And what does that mean? to serve, to call others to repentance. We can go on a mission or have other official service in the church. That's wonderful. But what are some other ways that we can help others repent? If we know how great joy is brought to the Savior when we are engaged in this service. How great? Well, let's take a look at the next few verses. Verse 15, And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. And now, if your joy will be great with one soul that you have brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me. From the Institute Manual, there's a short story that was given in General Conference by President Thomas S. Monson in October 1994 that talks about this very thing. As a young apostle, President Monson was attending a state conference with a member of the General Church Welfare Committee, Paul C. Child, who addressed the priesthood brethren this way. He said, quote, He turned to section 18 and began to read verses 10 and 15. President Child then raised his eyes from the scriptures and asked the brethren, What is the worth of a human soul? He avoided calling on a bishop, a stake president, or a high counselor for a response. Instead, he selected the president of an elders quorum. I prayed fervently for that quorum president. He remained silent for what seemed like an eternity and then declared, Brother Child, The worth of a human soul is its capacity to become as God. All present pondered that reply. Brother Child returned to the stand, leaned over to me, and said, A profound reply! A profound reply! He proceeded with his message, but I continued to reflect on that inspired response. End quote. In a later talk in General Conference, October 2012, he also emphasized Quote, we have the responsibility to see individuals not as they are, but rather as they can become. I would plead with you to think of them in this way, end quote. I think one of the ways, because you know there are people that are hard to see that way, I think we need to make sure that we are seeing with God's vision of who they could be, seeing them with the Holy Spirit to to open our eyes. And that would include how we view ourselves. Yeah, and that's a very good point. So back to that original thought, what are some ways that we can cry repentance if we don't do it in an official way? Well, one is treating people, as President Monson just described, treating them in a way that demonstrates we understand that we all have divine potential. That's got to be one way that helps. I had a friend that asked recently, uh, it was a sad situation where a dear friend of his is moving away from the gospel path and asked what he could do to help to bring her back. And I thought, you know, we do wonder that. And I'm not saying that there aren't direct things that we can do. But in my experience, I found the best thing I could do is to be the best person I can be. If I turn to the Lord 
and help him to change my heart, I will see them differently. I will love them differently. And they can feel the light. The more light I have to share because I have it in me, to me, I think that's one of the most powerful things that we can do to help people. But not to say there aren't many other ways to share, but it's a great thing to think about. If we know that all of this joy is tied up into this, maybe we should be asking ourselves those questions in our prayers of how we can be a part of it. Now, going on, think about this. When we take upon us the name of Christ, as his is the only name by which we can be saved, as it says in verse 23, then what are our privileges and our responsibilities when we take upon us the name of Christ? Let's start in 18. Ask the Father in my name in faith, believing you shall receive and you shall have the Holy Ghost which manifesteth all things which are expedient unto the children of men. That's a privilege for taking upon us the name of Christ. How about in 22? Invite others to be baptized and endure to the end. That's a privilege. And in verse 25, receive salvation in the kingdom of the Father. That's a privilege. But then here we have some other responsibilities in this same block of verses. Maybe we could see in verse 19, if you have not faith, hope, and charity, you can do nothing. Well, what does that mean? It means we have a responsibility, if we're going to take upon us the name of Christ, that we do need to have faith, hope, and charity. Those are traits that we need to ask for and develop. In verse 20, we have a responsibility to avoid contending with other churches. In verse 21, speak the truth in soberness. That's a responsibility. And although we may look at these responsibilities and say, well, sure, I can stop fighting with other churches or speak the truth, this may take practice, these responsibilities. How can then you engage in people of other beliefs without leading to the spirit of contention? How can you speak truth in a way that is sober, serious, and profound? In verse 22, we have a responsibility to repent and endure to the end. So what does it mean to stand as a witness of Christ? Those are some examples in those verses. Elder M. Russell Ballard in the October 2011 General Conference offers this insight on that principle as well. He says, quote, This means that we must be willing to let others know whom we follow and to whose church we belong, the church of Jesus Christ. We certainly want to do this in the spirit of love and testimony. We want to follow the Savior by simply and clearly, yet humbly, declaring that we are members of his church. Let me share, if I could, an interesting example of this in the opportunity that we have to be taught by a little child. My wife and I, we were visiting a family to test drive their van that they were selling. And we were just going to go around the block. So our oldest, who is like three at the time, wanted to stay with them while we took the van around the block, and that was fine with us. Judge us, if you will. And while we had taken the van around, apparently they had asked him what church he goes to. Now, Tristan had been practicing some scripture mastery scriptures. I was serving as an early morning seminary teacher at the time and involved Tristan in memorizing some scriptures, which he did a very good job at. One of the ones that Tristan had learned was Romans 1.16, which says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So when they asked him what church he goes to, he says, I go to the gospel of Christ. So he told us that when he left. And I thought, well, that's exactly the point of the scripture. I am not ashamed to say that I belong to the gospel of Christ. Now, it did remind me that I should probably teach him the full name of our church, but I thought that was great that he applied that scripture When asked, even as a young kid, what church do you go to? I belong to the gospel of Christ. Well, getting back to the verses a minute, one of the things that really stuck out to me this time is the standalone verse in verse 20. Contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil. Mm. Now, this reminded me of a couple of things. Number one, it reminded me of the Savior's words during his mortal ministry. An example is in Luke 9, verse 50, where he says, for he that is not against us is for us. But also, when we talk about the church of the devil, there's a quote from the Institute Manual, 
from President Joseph Fielding Smith, his book, Church History and Modern Revelation, where he says, quote, When we are commanded to contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil, we must understand that this is instruction to us to contend against all evil, that which is opposed to righteousness and truth, end quote. And the Institute Manual adds, it is not a call to oppose other churches or their members. Think yeah. about that in context, especially with our brethren of other Christian churches. These people believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer, too. Yeah. How is that evil? Yeah. And in a world such as today, it is more imperative than ever before that we who stand for righteousness and faith and freedom of religion and the family that we are able to bond together to fight the forces that are against those things. Now, by my comment, don't misunderstand me. The church of the devil is very real and is very pervasive in today's society. But instead of thinking about it in terms of a church institution as we would recognize it today, think about it in the context of those organizations promoting something that is contrary to the gospel truths. Great point. Going on in verse 26, And now behold, there are others who are called to declare my gospel, both unto Gentile and unto Jew, yea, even twelve. And the twelve shall be my disciples, and they shall take upon them my name. And the twelve are they who shall desire to take upon them my name with full purpose of heart. And if they desire to take upon them my name with full purpose of heart, they are called to go into all the world to preach my gospel unto every creature. And they are they who are ordained of me to baptize in my name according to that which is written. And you have that which is written before you. Wherefore, you must perform it according to the words which are written. Ah, so there are going to be twelve but we don't have the 12 quite yet. And what are the responsibilities of these 12? Well, let's take a look at the next few verses, 31. And now I speak unto you, the 12. Behold, my grace is sufficient for you. You must walk uprightly before me and sin not. And behold, you are they who are ordained of me to ordain priests and teachers to declare my gospel according to the power of the Holy Ghost, which is in you and according to the callings and gifts of God unto men. And I, Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God, have spoken it. Now that is fascinating. What we're seeing here is the beginning of what we would recognize today as a hierarchical structure of church leadership. It's the nature of these twelve to call subservants to preach the gospel, priests and teachers, etc. This is interesting, too, because, as John pointed out, they're not here yet. No, they this are not. This is a revelation to them when they arrive. Now, Stephen C. Harper, who is an incredible church scholar on church history, in his commentary posted in Doctrine and Covenant Central, he offers this insight. What does the Lord emphasize when he commissions apostles, when he gives them their job description? their marching orders. He teaches them that Christ's atonement, the price paid, makes each soul of infinite worth in God's sight. Based on that truth, he commissions the apostles to tell every soul to repent, to obey the law of the gospel, to become one with Christ by assuming his name. I thought that was a great summary of what we've covered so far. That is great. Let's go on with verse 37. And now behold, I give unto you, Oliver Cowdery, and also unto David Whitmer, that you shall search out the twelve, who shall have the desires of which I have spoken, and by their desires and their works you shall know them. And when you have found them, you shall show these things unto them, and you shall fall down, and worship the Father in my name. Isn't that interesting? Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer 
are kind of apostles to find apostles. They are people who have already received witnesses and miracles, and now they are called to find the 12, not to be in the 12, but to find the 12. That is interesting. And the nature of when you have found them, you shall show them these things. What are these things? Is it this revelation? Just an interesting thought. Now, the Institute Manual gives us a summary of how impactful these verses were on David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. Quote, when the apostles were called in February 1835, Oliver Cowdery stated that from the time this revelation was received in 1829, our minds have been on a constant stretch to find who these 12 were, end quote. So this was really impactful to them. It was six years from the time of this revelation until the apostles were called. And take a look at this list of names here of the first quorum of the 12, Lyman Johnson, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, David W. Patton, Luke Johnson, William E. McClellan, John F. Boynton, Orson Pratt, William Smith, Thomas B. Marsh, and Parley P. Pratt. Now, maybe you don't know all of those names, but maybe some of those names are familiar, maybe even famous in church history. And yet, they aren't here yet. With the exception of Joseph's brother, William, None of these men, as far as I could tell, were known to Joseph. But the Lord knew them and that they were out there. They just needed to be found. Now that brings us to section 19. And to understand the context of this revelation, let's take a look at Saints, Volume 1, Chapter 8. In early July, 1829, with manuscript in hand, Joseph knew the Lord wanted him to publish the Book of Mormon and spread its message far and wide. But the publishing business was unfamiliar to him and his family. He had to keep the manuscript safe, find a printer, and somehow get the book in the hands of people willing to consider the possibility of new scripture. Publishing a book as long as the Book of Mormon would also not be cheap. Joseph's finances had not improved since he started the translation, and all the money he made went toward providing for his family. The same was true for his parents, who were still poor farmers working land they did not own. Joseph's only friend who could finance the project was Martin Harris. Joseph set to work quickly. Before he completed the translation, he had filed for the book's copyright to protect the text from anyone who might steal or plagiarize it. With Martin's assistance, Joseph also started looking for a printer who would agree to publish the book. They went first to Egbert Grandin, a printer in Palmyra who was the same age as Joseph. Grandin declined the proposal at once, believing the book was a fraud. Undeterred, Joseph and Martin kept searching and found a willing printer in a nearby city. But before accepting his offer, they returned to Palmyra and asked Grandin once more if you wanted to publish the book. I should point out before we continue that the reason that they didn't immediately accept this other printer's offer is that it was very expensive. And so they went back to Grandin, hoping that they might be able to have him reconsider. Back to the book. This time, Grandin seemed more willing to take the project, but he wanted to be paid $3,000 to print and bind 5,000 copies before he even started work. Martin had already promised to help pay for the printing, but to come up with that kind of money, he realized he might need to mortgage his farm. It was an enormous burden for Martin, but he knew none of Joseph's other friends could help him with the money. Troubled, Martin began to question the wisdom of financing the Book of Mormon. He had one of the best farms in the area. If he mortgaged his land, he risked losing it. Wealth he had spent a lifetime accruing could be gone in an instant if the Book of Mormon did not sell well. Martin told Joseph his concerns and asked him to seek a revelation for him. In response, the Savior spoke of his sacrifice to do his Father's will, regardless of the cost. He described his ultimate suffering while paying the price for sin so that all might repent and be forgiven. He then commanded Martin to sacrifice his own interests to bring about God's plan. Thou shalt not covet thine own property, the Lord said, but impart it freely 
to the printing of the Book of Mormon. The book contained the true word of God, the Lord assured Martin, and it would help others believe the gospel. Although his neighbors would not understand his decision, Martin obeyed the Lord and mortgaged his farm to guarantee payment. Now, one of the things that I thought about when I looked at this is what was $3,000 like in 1829 as opposed to 2021? Now, that's a difficult thing to really meter with any kind of exactness, but when I looked it up, it was the equivalent today of about $80,000. It was actually a pretty wide range. It was from 80000 to even as high as a million. But I think the point here is, this would be the equivalent of someone living today who had a house paid off and perhaps had another house that they used as a rental property that was also paid off. And someone came up to them and said, okay, I need you to help me print this book. It will cost $80,000. Well, that's not money that Martin could simply write a check for or pull out of his pocket. And that was potentially really damaging to an otherwise well-built fortune. So not something to be taken lightly. Also of interest, this particular revelation had some dating issues early on. The 1833 Book of Commandments dated this revelation as March 1830, but recent research through the Joseph Smith Papers Project has placed it in the summer of 1829, as the current edition of the Doctrine and Covenants shows. That was an excellent summary and a great context. Let's get into the text of the revelation itself, starting with verse 1 of section 19. I am Alpha and Omega. For those familiar with those terms, that's the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet. Christ the Lord, yea, even I am he, the beginning and the end, the Redeemer of the world. I have accomplished and finished the will of him whose I am, even the Father, concerning me, having done this that I might subdue all things unto myself, retaining all power even to the destroying of Satan and his works at the end of the world, and the last great day of judgment, which I shall pass upon the inhabitants thereof, judging every man according to his works, and the deeds which he hath done. And surely every man must repent or suffer, for I, God, am endless. Now that's an interesting phrase. First of all, it's a wonderful introduction. It's very powerful. But there's an interesting phrase there, judging every man according to his works and the deeds which he hath done. There's a quote that both Jay and I love from Elder Dallin H. Oaks, and we've quoted it before in the show, but it bears repeating. This is from October 2000 General Conference. He says, quote, The final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgment of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. It is not enough for anyone just to go through the motions. The commandments, ordinances, and covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits required to be made in some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. End quote. Yeah, I do love that one. So important. You know, and it's such a fascinating way to introduce this revelation to Martin, who is desperate for clear instructions from the Lord. And, of course, he begins those first four verses by making very clear who it is who is speaking. Let's go on in verse 6 and think about how does the Lord define endless or eternal punishment? Verse 6, Nevertheless, it is not written that there shall be no end to this torment, but it is written, endless torment. Again, it is written, eternal damnation. Wherefore, it is more expressed than other scriptures, that it might work upon the hearts of the children of men, altogether for my name's glory. Wherefore, I will explain unto you this mystery. For it is meet unto you to know even as mine apostles, I speak unto you 
that are chosen in this thing, even as one, that you may enter into my rest. For behold, the mystery of godliness, how great is it! For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment is God's punishment. Endless punishment is God's punishment. So while that might be a little confusing, there is a clarification that's given from Elder James E. Talmadge in the April 1930 General Conference. I found this quote in the Institute Manual. He says, quote, To hell there is an exit as well as an entrance. Hell is no place to which a vindictive judge sends prisoners to suffer and to be punished principally for his glory. But it is a place prepared for the teaching, the disciplining of those who fail to learn here upon the earth what they should have learned. True, we read of everlasting punishment, unending suffering, eternal damnation. That is a direful expression. But in his mercy, the Lord has made plain what those words mean. Eternal punishment, he said, is God's punishment, for he is eternal. And that condition or state or possibility will ever exist for the sinner who deserves and really needs such condemnation. But this does not mean that the individual sufferer or sinner is to be eternally and everlastingly made to endure and suffer. No man will be kept in hell longer than is necessary to bring him to a fitness for something better. When he reaches that stage, the prison doors will open, and there will be rejoicing among the hosts who welcome him into a better state. The Lord has not abated in the least what he has said in earlier dispensations concerning the operation of his law and his gospel, but he has made clear unto us his goodness and mercy through it all, for it is his glory and his work to bring about the immortality and eternal life of man, end quote. That concept is incredibly exciting. Casey Paul Griffiths, in his Doctrine and Covenants central commentary, offers this summary of that. He says, quote, The Lord's name is endless and eternal, nouns, not adjectives. These terms denote his ownership of the punishment of the wicked and not the duration of of the punishment itself. Now, going on in this next set of verses in section 19, verses 15 through 20, before we get into the verses, Stephen C. Harper wrote a wonderful commentary on this that I thought I'd read first. It's posted at Doctrine and Covenants Central from his book, Doctrine and Covenants Contexts. It says, quote, this is the best autobiographical description of the Savior's atoning suffering in the scriptures. It is wrenching, beautiful, and powerful. Compare section 18, for example, where the Savior speaks briefly and modestly in the third person voice to describe how he suffered the pain of all so that all might repent. It's the same doctrine declared by the same Christ, but in an entirely different voice and tone. Section 19 is adapted to Martin's present predicament, which Christ knows how to address. So as we go on in verse 15, think of the fact that this isn't just written to the church. These verses are powerful by themselves, but they were revealed to Martin for a specific purpose. Starting in verse 15, therefore I command you to repent. Repent, lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth and by my wrath and by my anger, and your sufferings be sore, how sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, yea, how hard to bear you know not. For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer, if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer, even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit. 
and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. Wherefore I command you to repent, lest I humble you with my almighty power, and that you confess your sins, lest you suffer these punishments of which I have spoken, of which the smallest, yea, even in the least degree, you have tasted at the time I withdrew my spirit. Those are some of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture, and yet, at the same time, the most terrifying. Yeah. The Institute Manual includes a quote from Elder James E. Talmadge's book, Jesus the Christ, a favorite of mine, and it summarizes what the Savior is describing here. Quote, Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable by the finite mind, both as to intensity and cause. He struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has lived on earth might even conceive as possible. In that hour of anguish, Christ met and overcame all the horrors that Satan, the prince of this world, could inflict, in some manner actual and terribly real, though to man incomprehensible, the Savior took upon himself the burden of the sins of mankind from Adam to the end of the world, end quote. But also, I wanted to include one more quote that I found in the Institute Manual. This is from then-Elder Dallin H. Oaks from an Enzyme article, July 1992, called Sin and Suffering. There's an interesting application here in regards to the application of Christ's suffering. Lest we take a stance that, oh, well, we can sin and Christ will suffer for it, this is what Elder Oaks has to say. Quote, There is a relationship between sin and suffering that is not understood by people who knowingly sin in the expectation that all the burden of suffering will be borne by another that the sin is all theirs, but that the suffering is all his. That is not the way. Repentance, which is an assured passage to an eternal destination, is nevertheless not a free ride. Let us recall two scriptures. One, repentance could not come unto men except there were a punishment. And two, the Savior said that he had suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. This obviously means that the unrepentant transgressor must suffer for his own sins. Does it also mean that a person who repents does not need to suffer at all because the entire punishment is borne by the Savior? That cannot be the meaning because it would be inconsistent with the Savior's other teachings. What is meant is that the person who repents does not need to suffer even as the Savior suffered for that sin. Sinners who are repenting will experience some suffering, but because of their repentance and the atonement, they will not experience the full, exquisite extent of eternal torment the Savior suffered. End quote. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, in a conference talk in April 1987, offers this insight as well. He says, quote, Let not Jesus' redemption for us stop at the immortalizing dimension of the atonement. Let us grasp the provided gift of eternal life. We will end up either choosing Christ's manner of living or his manner of suffering. It is either suffer even as I, or overcome, even as he overcame. I love that. So perhaps what Elder Maxwell is telling us is that we should choose life? We should choose life. Yes, indeed. But what might this have meant specifically to Martin? As powerful as these verses are, Stephen C. Harper, again from his commentary in the Doctrine and Covenant Central, says, quote, Throughout section 19, there is subtle allusion in which Christ compares himself to Martin implicitly. As Martin wrestles 
with whether he should keep his promises and whether the sacrifice asked of him is too great, the Savior declares his character. He keeps promises. He made the infinite sacrifice. Where Martin is concerned with carnal security, the Savior shows contempt for covetousness. Where Martin is coveting his own property, the Lord compares it to the priceless testament of Jesus Christ, the Book of Mormon, which contains the truth and word of God. Isn't that an interesting comparison? If Martin had kept his finances, his farm, his property, not mortgaged them, who would care today? You know, what effect would that have on the world? That would only really benefit him then at that time, maybe somebody else, but I mean, it's so small. And yet the Lord is reminding him how big this work is. And think about what Martin did and its effect on the world. Amazing. So let's go on in verse 21 through 23. And I command you that you preach not but repentance and show not these things unto the world until it is wisdom in me. For they cannot bear meat now, but milk they must receive. Wherefore, they must not know these things, lest they perish. Learn of me, and listen to my words. Walk in the meekness of my spirit, and you shall have peace in me. You know, that's a really interesting set of verses. One of the things to consider, lest we just assume that Martin Harris is this wicked man, the Lord has trusted him with some truths in this revelation that he was clearly ready to receive, but that others were not. That gives us a little bit of an insight into Martin's desires at the very least. We all struggle sometimes to live the gospel and to make sacrifices that are required of us, but that doesn't necessarily take away from where we want to go and our desires. Yeah. Also from that set of verses, the phrase, learn of me, is particularly interesting to me. There's a quote from the Institute Manual from President Thomas S. Monson from October 2001 General Conference, where he says, quote, fill your mind with truth. We do not find truth groveling through error. Truth is found by searching, studying, and living the revealed word of God. We adopt error when we mingle with error. We learn truth when we associate with truth. The Savior of the world instructed, Seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. He added, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He invites each of us, Learn of me, and listen to my words. Walk in the meekness of my spirit, and you shall have peace in me, end quote. I love that. So it's a great question to ask, how does this apply to your life today? Do you need peace? Do you have fears and concerns? If so, there's a source that can give us peace. Learn of Christ. Listen to his words. Walk in the meekness of his spirit. That is where true peace can be found. And what's one of the easiest ways that we can learn of the Savior and listen to his words? Read the scriptures. Yeah. Make sure that you're studying your scriptures. Definitely. Let's get back to the section, verse 26, and let's take a look for what additional commandments the Lord is giving to Martin Harris. 26, and again, I command thee that thou shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon, which contains the truth of the word of God, which is my word to the Gentile, that soon it may go to the Jew, of whom the Lamanites are a remnant, that they may believe the gospel and look not for a Messiah to come who has already come. Yeah, again, put your will on the altar for something that is so much better. And we should point out that Martin's land, a lot of it was lost due to this. His fears were confirmed. Yeah. 
But what was the return? Yeah, for the world, and maybe not for Martin specifically, although I would still argue for Martin specifically, but even if you took that out of it, sometimes there's bigger things at play than what we want. And as you continue to study those verses, even, you know, back to 25 and then go all the way to 33, notice phrases like, I command thee, or thou shalt, statements as regards the Lord's counsel to Martin Harris. In particular, let's take a look at those last two verses in that scripture block, 32 and 33. The Lord says, Behold, this is a great and the last commandment which I shall give unto you concerning this matter. For this shall suffice for thy daily walk, even unto the end of thy life. And misery thou shalt receive, if thou wilt slight these counsels. Yea, even the destruction of thyself and property. I think it's worth noting that this isn't a threat. It's a heads up for the loss of blessings and protections that Martin would have if he slighted these counsels from God. So let's go on in verses 34 and 35. The Lord here gives specific temporal instructions to Martin. In 34, impart a portion of thy property, yea, even part of thy lands, and all, save the support of thy family, pay the debt thou hast contracted with the printer. Release thyself from bondage. That is a particularly interesting set of verses to me for a couple of reasons. One, notice that the Lord is not asking him to put his family support in danger. There's a notion of the importance of Martin being able to support his family. And so I really appreciated that. But also, it's interesting to me that for those who gain more wealth than they necessarily need for the support of their family, I wonder if often it's an opportunity for us to use that additional wealth to further the Lord's purposes. And here Martin is being given that opportunity and the Lord is spelling it out clearly for him. But I also like the notion in verse 35, pay the debt thou hast contracted with the printer, release thyself from bondage. There is a great quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley that I found in the Institute Manual. This was a very impactful quote for my wife and I personally when it was given. This is from October 1998 General Conference. He says, quote, Since the beginnings of the church, the Lord has spoken on the matter of debt. To Martin Harris, through revelation, he said, Pay the debt thou hast contracted with the printer. Release thyself from bondage. President Heber J. Grant spoke repeatedly on this matter. He said, If there is any one thing that will bring peace and contentment into the human heart and into the family, it is to live within our means. And if there is any one thing that is grinding and discouraging and disheartening, it is to have debts and obligations that one cannot meet. I urge you to look to the condition of your finances. I urge you to be modest in your expenditures. Discipline yourselves in your purchases to avoid debt to the extent possible. Pay off debt as quickly as you can and free yourselves from bondage. This is a part of the temporal gospel in which we believe. May the Lord bless you to set your houses in order. If you have paid your debts, if you have a reserve, even though it be small, then should storms howl about your head, you will have shelter for your families and peace in your hearts. That's all I have to say about it, but I wish to say it with all the emphasis of which I am capable, end quote. I love that. That's very good counsel. I can say for myself, I know culturally in our country, we don't spend a lot of time publicly speaking about finances, but I felt both the bondage and the freedom at various times in my life. And I could testify to the truth of what President Hinckley is saying. That's true. And I have experienced both sides of this, too. This is one of the reasons why it was so inspiring to my wife and I so many years ago. And to add to what President Hinckley mentioned in the mention of a reserve or, you know, a savings, it's been said that a savings or a reserve 
turns an emergency into an inconvenience. And that's very true. Now, back in the old days, there was a pamphlet called One for the Money. And as simple as that is, and it's probably still out there, it was a huge blessing to my wife and I when we were a young couple. There are some new resources today that if you're not aware of, let me point you in the direction. If you go to your Gospel Library app, at the bottom it says Life Help. If you click that, the first one is Self-Reliance. You can click that, and there will be a list of resources right there. And this one right here is Personal Finances for Self-Reliance. Also, many stakes run a self-reliance program, which has classes on these various topics. So I would encourage you to get involved with that, or at the very least, take a look over the resources that are here under personal finances and self-reliance. They can be very helpful because it's not just tools. And I would really offer, these are tools that work, but it's also found in, in gospel principles, which makes them even more powerful. Agreed. And at the very least, Take some time to seriously evaluate your financial situation and see how you're doing and see where there might be some improvement. Sometimes if any of you are like me, finances or other circumstances in life can be scary or feel overwhelming. Verse 38 offers some great counsel when we're asked to do something hard. Pray always and I will pour out my spirit upon you and great shall be your blessing. Yea, even more than if you should obtain treasures of earth and the corruptibleness to the extent thereof. In other words, if we do the will of the Lord, he will give us blessings that are far greater in value than the treasures of the earth. That's very true. Now, the Lord ends this revelation in a very unique way to me. Let's take a look at verse 39. Behold, Canst thou read this without rejoicing and lifting up thy heart for gladness? Or canst thou run about longer as a blind guide? Or canst thou be humble and meek and conduct thyself wisely before me? Yea, come unto me, thy Savior. Amen. I love that. That's very personal and very pleading. Yeah, lovingly pleading. Yeah, and reminding Martin that, yeah, I've said some harsh things in this revelation, but can you read this without rejoicing? This is good news. Yeah, it is good news. And it worked. The Lord's counsel, Martin did humble himself. Martin Harris obeyed the command to impart of his property to finance the printing of the Book of Mormon. He mortgaged and eventually sold 151 acres of his farm. And because of Martin's choice... Millions of lives have been blessed and will continue to be blessed. Isn't that remarkable? I just so grateful. What's amazing in church history is we get to see the good and the bad in a variety of people. And yet, the good has made such a difference in the moving forth of the gospel. So grateful. And what a great example to us. Be sure that you're taking some time this coming week to evaluate your home situation, but also be sure to continue reading your scriptures. That's what's going to give you the strength to do hard things. And we'll talk to you more about that in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.